Okay, let's get started here. Hello everyone and welcome to our ECOM seminar today. My name is Ivan Ortega and I am very happy to introduce our speaker today, uh, Bruno Franco. Bruno is joining us from Brussels and thank you very much Bruno for, for accepting the invitation. Uh, Bruno graduated from the University of Liege in Belgium in 2007 with a master degree in physical geography. At the University of Liege, uh, Bruno started a PhD in the laboratory of climatology dedicated to the modeling of the surface and energy balance of the Greenland, Greenland ice sheet under climate change. Bruno obtained his PhD in 2012. A few months after that, still at the University of Liege, he moved to the Department of Astrophysics and Geophysics where he was introduced to the remote sensing of the atmospheric composition by Emmanuel Mahieu. In, in his group, Bruno performed retrievals of VOCs from the ground-based FPIR spectra recorded at the Jungfrajok station, which is affiliated to the ENDAC infrared working group. Uh, in early 2016, Bruno started a postdoc at the research center of ULIC in Germany in the atmospheric modeling group led by Martin Schulz and then by uh, Domenico Taraporelli. Uh, Domenico is also actually joining us in this seminar. Thanks, Domenico. Uh, their work on formic acid started at, at, at that time. Finally, in mid 2017, Bruno came back to Belgium in the chemistry department of the University of Brussels. Since then, he implements artificial neural networks uh, to retrieve VOCs from the infrared observations of the EASI satellite instrument. Now, so today we're using a slide to post uh, questions, which you can ask at any time during the seminar. Most of you might be familiar with a slide, but if you are not, you can scroll down the webpage of the presentation where you are right now, and you can see the slide interface at the bottom of the of the webpage. Questions will be passed to Bruno at the end of the presentation. And again, thank you so much, Bruno. Welcome and please take it away. So hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction, Ivan. And uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, attending this, um, this uh, seminar. It's a real pleasure for me uh, to be here and to be able to present my work on uh, formic acid. Of course, I, I didn't work alone uh, on that topic, so I closely collaborated with uh, Domenico Taraborelli from the Research Center uh, of uh, Yuli. And uh, as uh, Ivan explained, I'm more a remote sensing guy, while Domenico is a chemist, a very good modeler, so it was really a team effort. We really put together our own expertise to work on that uh, topic. So, um, I would like to start my uh, talk uh, with this very interesting uh, figure, which uh, represented the atmospheric acidity uh, from the, the begin, uh, beginning of the previous century. So here on the right, up to almost uh, nowadays. So here on the, the left and the atmospheric acidity in that paper published in 2016 has been determined by the H plus uh, content that was retrieved in the fern course taken uh, in Greenland. And in, what is interesting to notice is this uh, huge enhancement of atmospheric acid, acidity during the 70s and the 80s, and uh, which was due to important emissions of the nitrogen and sulfur oxides uh, at that time, and uh, which react with cold droplets to um, form nitric and sulfuric acid. So uh, at that time, we discovered the, the, the issue with the famous acid rain. And following the mitigation of these emissions, we can observe that the atmospheric acidity is progressively returning to lower levels. So in such a context, uh, the, this means that the acidity in the atmosphere is increasingly determined by natural sources, of course, by carbon dioxide, dioxide but also by organic acids. And this is why it is uh, very important to, to have a good representation and a good understanding of organic acids uh, in the atmosphere. So formic acid uh, is by far the most abundant carboxylic acid in the atmosphere. 
as explained, is contributes to the acidity of cloud and rainwater. And for example, it has been estimated that along with acetic acid, it can contribute up to 60% of the acidity of rainwater in the remote regions. So where we have much, much less nitric and sulfuric acid. This is also a key compound to the aqueous phase chemistry because for example, it can influence the levels of oxidant. It is also present in the aerosol phase as formate, where it can facilitate the activation of cloud droplets. What we know so far about formic acid from many laboratory and field studies is that it is actually very little emitted directly into the atmosphere. So this is rather produced by a, a suite of chemical reactions in the atmosphere, reactions that involve a lot of uh, precursors. However, there is a, a long-standing issue with formic acid. So despite all our knowledge in atmospheric chemistry, when we put together all the known sources of uh, formic acid, so all the, the known chemical pathways that lead to the formation of formic acid, we can explain only a, a fraction of the formic acid that is observed in uh, the atmosphere. And this is the case in both uh, polluted and uh, remote regions. So concretely, this means that uh, with our model simulations, we observe very large discrepancies between uh, the model predictions and uh, the observations. So this is uh, nicely illustrated in that plot taken from Dylan Millet's paper in 2015, in, uh, in which you can observe that uh, geoschem simulations of formic acid are completely underestimating the formic acid concentrations measured during the Senex uh, campaign. So all these persistent discrepancies point to at least one major key process that is still unidentified. So um, in particular, during the last decade, there have been numerous uh, papers that proposed or attempted missing sources in order to explain these discrepancies. So the, the missing sources were mainly secondary sources, and they were, for example, related to the vegetation, for example, to the isoprene degradation, or again, they were related to the, uh, the degradation of VOCs in biomass burning plume, or again, to the degradation of anthropogenic VOCs, for example, the aromatics that are quite abundant in urban areas. Or again, other sources that were proposed were related to the aging of organic aerosols. However, for uh, some of these uh, proposed or attempted sources, sometimes there were no laboratory measurements to, to support these sources. And sometimes also the chemical pathways that were proposed were uh, affected by very large uncertainties or were simply um, speculative. So in, in many cases, in most cases actually, um, the missing sources that were proposed uh, do not uh, explain the elevated concentrations of formic acid that you observe in the troposphere, in particular in air masses with a low VOC uh, content. So this means that currently it seems that there is no atmospheric model that is able to uh, offer a consistent picture of formic acid uh, in the atmosphere. This is why with Domenico we decided to investigate that issue with the help of the IMAC model. So IMAC is a chemistry climate model, which is based on the general circulation model ECAM5. It implements the modular Earth, Earth submodel system called uh, MESI. And this uh, submodel system uh, links together actually uh, many submodels that describe, for example, the, the gas phase uh, chemistry in the troposphere, the exchange between the air and sea, the emissions, and, and so on. So IMAC is uh, uh, one strand of IMAC is that it, is, uh, it uh, represents explicitly um, the multiphase uh, chemistry. Uh, uh, it has online representation, detailed representation. So for example, the, the one main strain of IMAC is its gas phase chemistry, so which is based on the, the, the mines organic mechanism called MOM, uh, which represents uh, a lot of species, a lot of reactions. This consists of a very extensive oxidation scheme, for example, for isoprene, monoterpenes, uh, aromatics, and many of their degradation products. Another strand of uh, IMAC is the submodel SCAV, which represents uh, explicitly the scavenging of many species, as well as the aqueous phase processes, um, as well as many aqueous phase processes. And we will see together that 
uh, the, a good representation of these aqueous processes is, is key for a good understanding of formic acid in the atmosphere. So in its base case configuration, IMAC uh, implements the chemical formation pathways of formic acid that are usually accounted for. Um, for example, the, the first one is the ozonolysis of alkenes with a terminal uh, double bond. So uh, this might be simple alkenes or again degradation products of hydrocarbons. So under ozonolysis, uh, these alkenes produce Krieg intermediates, which lead to the production of hydroximethyl hydroperoxide, which is an important precursor of formic acid. Another pathway is the oxidation of alkyne, uh, alkyne. for example, uh, acetylene. Another one is the, the, the oxidation of the hydroperoxy radical uh, by the hydroxy, per, uh, hydroperoxy radical of formaldehyde. And this mainly occurs at low temperatures. So this means that uh, it is um, mainly active in the upper troposphere. And the last main formation pathway that is accounted for is the oxidation of vinyl alcohol by OH. So as you can see here, according to the mechanism uh, described by So et al. in 2014, we see two branchings for the OH oxidation of uh, vinyl alcohol, and both of them lead to the production of formic acid. Vinyl, vinyl alcohol itself is uh, produced uh, in the model from acetaldehyde that undergo the ketoenol tautomerization. Um, but there are also the sources of vinyl alcohol in the, the, the mechanism, for example, the photolysis of butanol or again of uh, pyruvic acids. However, here we exclude some formations pathways that are um, uh, poorly known. For example, we, we exclude here the formic acid formation from the oxidation of isoprene and monoterpenes by OH, because the, the corresponding mechanisms are um, mainly speculative. We also exclude the reaction of the methyl peroxy radical plus OH, which was shown not to yield uh, formic acid. And for the evaluation of the, the model simulations, we are mainly using remote sensing measurements for uh, two reasons. The first one is because with one remote sensing measurement, we can obtain uh, the integrated abundance uh, of formic acid through uh, the, the vertical layers. So from the top of the atmosphere to the surface, and also, uh, especially with uh, satellite measurements, it is easier to build uh, an extensive data set that is consistent in space and time, and that is well suited for the, the evaluation of global models uh, at the global scales. So the first type of remote sensing measurements we are using here are the remote uh, sense, uh, the, sorry, the ground-based FTIR measurements of formic acid. So indeed, formic acid can be retrieved uh, at several uh, stations, uh, mainly affiliated to the infrared working group of uh, the NDAC network. These stations are located at different uh, latitudes and in remote, uh, in several environments, for example, remote environments such as Eureka and Thule, uh, while others uh, instruments, for example, the one located in Toronto is actually in uh, the city center. So from this type of FTIR measurements, we can obtain a solar spectra, mainly in the thermal infrared, and by applying uh, inversion processes, so regularization methods, we can obtain the vertical abundance uh, of the target species, as well as vertical uh, uh, information with respect to the distribution of the target species. So let's consider now the uh, comparison between uh, the, the model results, so the, the simulations of the model in its base case configuration, and the FTIR measurements at a few stations. So for example, Eureka here, the Canadian Arctic, Kiruna in Sweden, Boulder, and also uh, Wollongong in Southeast Australia. So the data that are displayed there uh, are a three-year average of the formic acid total columns. So the FTIR measurements are in gray, while the formic acid total columns simulated by the model at, uh, at the FTIR stations are depicted here in purple. And at the first glance, it's pretty clear that the model, despite it implements all the known sources of formic acid, completely underestimates uh, formic acid at these stations. So this illustrates nicely the, the, the long-standing issue uh, with formic acid. 
Another type of FTIR uh, of remote sensing measurement we are using here are the, the measurement from the YASI satellite instrument. So YASI is the infrared atmospheric sounding interferometer. As you can see on this animation, this is a, an ideal sonder that measures uh, the radiance of the Earth and of the lower atmosphere in the thermal infrared. There are currently three YASI instruments in operations, and they are on board the METOP satellite platforms, so which are on a polar orbit, as you can see here. So YASI is a very interesting instrument for the monitoring of uh, reactive trace gases because um, it has a relatively high spectral resolution for satellite in instrument, relatively low noise, and one year's instrument achieves a global coverage twice a day. Um, so this means that uh, we can obtain a near global measurement of a target species uh, every day. So in our, for our study, we are using uh, daily global distributions of formic acid total columns that were retrieved here with a, a particular approach. So it was an approach based on a neural network. So this is a, a quite new product. This is now the global distribution of formic acid total columns, such as derived from uh, three years of uh, YASI measurements. And immediately you can observe the strong contributions of the, the continental source regions, for example, within the tropics, but also in the Northern hemisphere. But you can also observe that the, the columns of formic acid remain quite high uh, in remote areas, for example, also over the oceans. For the comparison with the model data, we have sampled the, the model data at the location and time of the YASI measurements in order to avoid uh, biases to, uh, due to different uh, samplings. And this is now the global distribution of formic acid, just, such as simulated by the, 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 the base simulation of the model. And here again, we can see that the model completely underpredicts at the global scale uh, the formic acid total columns compared to uh, YASI. However, we will uh, present now a new uh, and, and large chemical source of uh, formic acid, which involves multi-phase chemistry and which has the potential to, to reconcile model predictions and uh, observations. So how does that work? So as you know, of course, uh, many VOCs are emitted in the atmosphere from biogenic sources, biomass burning, and anthropogenic activities. As we have seen together, some of these VOCs through a suite of chemical pathways can lead to the formation of formic acid. Formic acid can be removed from the atmosphere by, for example, the oxidation by OH, which proceeds quite slowly. So this takes several days in the, the, the free troposphere. Uh, it can be also removed quite, um, quicker from the, the atmosphere through wet and dry deposition. Many of the VOCs, when they are degraded at some point, they also produce uh, formaldehyde, which is really ubiquitous in the, the troposphere. Formaldehyde is also quite uh, soluble. And once it is in the aqueous phase, for example, in cloud, uh, for example, when it is taken up by rain or cloud droplets, it is promptly hydrated to form its corresponding geminal diol called methane diol. Methane diol can be dehydrated and uh, to reform formaldehyde. It is also known that methane diol in the aqueous phase reacts with OH to form formic acid. Uh, formic acid can be removed from the aqueous phase through different processes, for example, through, through the rain, but uh, mainly it is very quickly oxidized by OH and removed from the aqueous phase. So this means that uh, uh, as a result, the net contribution of the formation of formic acid inside the clouds is uh, very, very small. And this is why when this uh, mechanism, this process uh, are accounted for in global models, it is assumed that formic acid is formed directly from formaldehyde. And in that case, methanediol is not even represented. However, we know from uh, kinetic data that under typical cloud conditions, the time scales for the dehydration of methanediol are quite long. So in the range of several hundreds of seconds. So this means that the dehydration of methanediol proceeds quite slowly, and that methanediol has plenty of time to undergo other processes. So for example, we can also consider that the, the, the time scales for the dehydration of methanediol 
are actually much longer than the time scales for the evaporation of cloud droplets, or again, the time scales for the, the, the aqueous phase diffusion. So this means that methendiol can volatilize, and uh, uh, we can have huge amount of methendiol that is outcast. And once in the, 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 the gas phase, we will show evidence that uh, methendiol reacts with OH to form a huge amount of uh, formic acid. To provide such evidence, we have performed uh, chamber experiments with the atmosphere sim simulation chamber SAFIR at the, the research center of uh, ULIC in Germany. And you can see the, the chamber on these pictures. So this is uh, a large outdoor chamber uh, equipped with a double wall foil in Teflon. And as you can see uh, on that picture, it is also equipped with a, a shutter system that allows to switch quickly between illumination and dark conditions. So we can quickly open or close the roof. There are also many instruments in order to, to, to measure the radicals, the trace gases, and uh, many physical parameters. So for our experiments, we have injected with the microliter syringe a solution of formalin that contains formaldehyde. And after the, the injection, uh, it, for, it produced a fine mist that was then evaporated in a heated flow of synthetic air, and then it was flushed uh, into the chamber. So for all our, all our experiments, we have followed the, 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 the same procedure. So uh, before the, the experiment starts, we have humidified uh, the chamber. So we have flushed the, the, the walls of the chamber. And uh, with the roof open, uh, this allowed us to, to quantify the, uh, the wall sources uh, for the VOC, so including formaldehyde and formic acid. At the beginning of the experiment, the, the roof was closed, and at some point, we injected the solution of formalin. Then at the stage two, we opened the roof again to let the, the photooxidation uh, proceed, uh, start, uh, to, to let the photooxidation start. And then at stage three, still with the roof open, we injected a huge amount of CO in order to, to scavenge the entire OH, so to, to suppress the photo oxidation. So during the, the, these experiments, we uh, monitored the concentrations of formic acid with the PTRMS instrument. We also used the Hench monitor in order to measure formaldehyde plus methendiol in the gas phase. So uh, it was not possible to dissociate one from another with the Hench monitor. However, with the DOAS instrument, we were able to measure the concentrations of formaldehyde alone. So we were able to calculate the concentrations of methendiol by making the difference between uh, the signals of the two instruments. Uh, we, will, uh, we also measured the concentrations in OH and the OH uh, reactivity. So what are the results of uh, these experiments? So uh, as you can see on that plot, during the, uh, uh, the stage one, we were under dark conditions. So the roof was, of the chamber was closed. At some point, we injected the solution of formalin, and very quickly, we were able to measure high concentrations of methendiol in the gas phase. So this shows that methendiol can volatilize. But uh, quite quickly, we observed uh, a decrease of the concentrations of methendiol, and it was concurrent with an increase of the formaldehyde in the gas phase. So this means that there was a conversion from methendiol to formaldehyde. So the, the concentrations of formaldehyde increased until it reached approximately the same levels uh, of, uh, as methendiol. And during this time, you can see here that the concentrations of formic acid remain quite stable. At the beginning of stage two, we let the photooxidation proceed by opening the roof. And immediately, Immediately, you can see that the concentrations of formaldehyde uh, start decreasing due to its reaction with OH. And you can also observe an accelerated decrease of the concentration in methendiol, and which is concurrent with an increase in the concentrations of uh, formic acid. So this shows that methendiol reacts with OH to form formic acid. And then at the beginning uh, of the stage three, we suppress the photo oxidation by injecting a huge amount of CO, so here at this step. And from that point, uh, we, we can see that the photo oxidation is suppressed so that there is no more formation of formic acid from uh, methane dial. So we have uh, uh, um, uh, fitted all these measurements uh, with a box model. 
So the measurements of formaldehyde are represented here in blue. Uh, these are the measurements of methane diol and the measurements of formic acid. And in red, you can observe the, the, the fit uh, with the box model. So for the box model calculation, they were constrained to the, the measured values of temperature, pressure, and uh, OH concentrations. You can see the OH concentrations here at the, the bottom in the bottom left uh, panel. So for example, here during the stage uh, one, we were under dark conditions, so the OH concentrations were close to uh, zero. So at the beginning of stage two, as we opened the roof, we can observe much higher concentrations of CO. And then after the injection of CO, uh, the OH concentrations were back to uh, zero. So for the box model calculations, we accounted, of course, for the injections of the formalin solution and of CO. We also uh, accounted for the raw sources of formic acid, uh, and these sources were evaluated here, so uh, in the, during the pre-stage, as well as after the injection of CO, so during stage three. The box model calculations adjusted the rate constant uh, of the conversion of methane diol in formaldehyde as well as the rate constant of this reaction, so methane diol plus OH, which produces formic acid. And this reaction uh, was confirmed uh, by theoretical calculations performed by Luc Verreken at the Research Center Ulic. So it was confirmed as being the, 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 the only fate possible in the gas phase for methane diol. So we obtained our best match for a rate constant for that reaction of 7.5 times 10 to the minus 12. We also performed some sensitivity runs with the box model calculation in which we modified, for example, the, the, the strength of the wool sources of formic acid. And in all cases, the, the rate constant for that reaction was uh, between one and 10 times 10 to the minus 12. Moreover, we also estimated uh, this rate constant uh, experimentally. And uh, so based on the measurement of methane diol and uh, based on the, the reactivity of OH that was attributed to methane diol only, and we obtained very consistent uh, rate constants. So now that we have demonstrated that uh, methane diol, uh, that huge amount of methane diol can be outgassed, and that in the gas phase, it reacts with OH to form formic acid. We can calculate that um, under typical midday conditions, the gas phase sink of methane diol, so that reaction with OH, is actually five times stronger than the same reaction in the aqueous phase. So uh, this means that the gas phase oxidation here sustains the chemical gradient that drives methane diol from the aqueous phase to the gas phase. Now that uh, we have obtained all these results, we uh, implemented this multiphase chemistry of formaldehyde and methane diol in the model. So we uh, explicitly represented, represented the, the, the kinetic model for the aqueous phase formations of these species. We implemented the bidirectional phase transfer as well as in the gas phase, uh, that reaction, so methane diol plus OH. Uh, which produces formic acid, and we use the rate constant that was obtained from the box model uh, calculations. However, there is still uh, one uncertainty. This is the solubility of methane diol, which is actually not known at uh, any temperature. So of course there are um, estimation methods, but they are affected by quite large uncertainties. This is why we have performed uh, two, two model simulations. Actually, these are the same simulations, but they only differ by the, the, the value of the Henry's law constant for methane diol. So in the simulation uh, called IMAC diol, the L stands for low solubility. So in that case, we implemented uh, an Henry's law constant of 10 to the 4, while with the other simulation called IMAC diol H, we assumed quite a high solubility of uh, methane diol, so two orders of magnitude higher, so uh, Henry's law constant in the range of uh, 10 to the 6. Now let's consider again our comparison between the model simulations and the FTIR data. As we have seen together previously, uh, the, the model in its base case configuration completely underestimated the formic acid columns. And these are now the, the, the new result, the result from the new model simulations. So uh, the, the model simulations implementing the multi-phase production of formic acid. 
So in blue, this is the model that assumes the high solubility of methane diol, while in green, this is the, the model simulation assuming a low solubility of methane diol. And here we, we can see that uh, you, we, you can see uh, uh, that a, a huge additional uh, amount of formic acid is produced thanks to the multiphase uh, chemistry. And we can observe that uh, now we have a much better agreement with the FTIR data. So this shows that this multiphase production of formic acid has the potential to reconcile model predictions and um, remote sensing measurements. Now let's have a look again at our comparison with the, the, the YASI data. So before we had an overall pre under prediction of formic acid. These are now the, the new distributions of formic acid that are obtained uh, from the new simulations. So with the, 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 the multiphase chemistry of formaldehyde and methane diol. And uh, as you can see, compared to the base case simulation, we have we produce much, much more formic acid. And we are now in a, in a much better agreement with the YASI data. And what is very interesting with that multiphase mechanism is that it, it potentially occurs uh, everywhere. So we, we can observe a uh, formation of formic acid uh, everywhere because cloud droplets may potentially form everywhere and because formaldehyde is ubiquitous in the troposphere. So this is why we observe a uh, large enhancement of formic acid in the regions with high VOC concentrations. So uh, for example, here over Central Africa or over Southeast uh, US, but we also observe a uh, huge enhancement of formic acid also in the remote environments, so for example, over the oceans, which is in much better agreement uh, with the YASI data. Of course, the comparison is still not perfect. We still have discrepancies. So for example, over the Amazon basin, uh, we, we see that uh, the IMAX simulation, uh, simulations now tend to over predict formic acid compared to the YASI data. And provincially, over the Russian boreal forest, we see that uh, IMAC, despite it produces much, much more formic acid, it still under predicts uh, the formic acid from the YASI data. So if we consider now the, the, the same comparison, but for formaldehyde this time. So this is the global distribution of formaldehyde, which is derived from the uh, OMI satellite measurements. And here, this is the formaldehyde uh, distribution from uh, the model. And here again, we can observe that the model simulates uh, too much formaldehyde over the Amazon basin, and not uh, compared to the OMI data, and not enough formaldehyde over the Russian boreal forest. So this means that uh, in regions where the model tend, tends to overpredict formaldehyde compared to the OMI data, for example, over Amazonia, this translates into an overprediction of uh, formic acid compared to the YASI data. And conversely, in regions where IMAC does not simulate enough formaldehyde, for example, during the Russian fires in August 2010, uh, this translates into another prediction of formic acid uh, that we can observe here compared to the YASI data. So this means that if we want to improve uh, further our comparison with the uh, satellite data, we need first uh, more realistic emissions of the VOCs. So for example, in biomass burning, as you can see here, and we need also to improve the modeling of uh, formaldehyde. However, we can still uh, revisit the global budget of formic acid. So in that table in red, you can observe the, the total production of formic acid uh, that is derived from a GeoSCAM simulations taken from uh, these two important papers from Fabian Polo and Dylan Millet. And in both cases, they, uh, they produce uh, around 60 teragram per year of uh, formic acid. In this more uh, recent study, we can observe that uh, uh, we can observe a lower production of formic acid. This is partly explained by the fact that in that model called Magrit, they accounted for, they implemented uh, more realistic dry deposition velocities for many VOCs, including hydroxymethyl hydroperoxide, which is an important precursor of formic acid, uh, especially over continental source regions. So the, the implementations of, uh, of these uh, new deposition velocities uh, in, uh, resulted in lower production of formic acid. 
In this third column, uh, these are the, this is the total production, not from a forward simulations, but from inverse modeling. So uh, using the chemistry transport images, they assimilated the, the, the first version of uh, the YASI measurements of formic acid, and they uh, made two scenarios. In the first one, they assumed that there was a, a, a missing direct source of formic acid, of biogenic origin. And in the second scenario, they assumed that there was a missing precursor in the atmosphere, likely of biogenic, uh, likely of biogenic origin as well. And in both cases, they obtained much, much uh, higher uh, production of formic acid, so over 100 teragram of formic acid per year. So this is now in red, the total production of formic acid we have with the, in the IMAC model in its base case configuration, so without the multiphase chemistry, and with uh, 43 teragram of formic acid per year, we are quite well in line with the, the, the other estimate from the, uh, the forward simulations. And now uh, this is the total production once we implement the multiphase production of formic acid. So uh, the, this total production ranges between 90 and almost 200 teragrams per year. So what is very interesting to notice is that first, uh, the, the, the multiphase production of formic acid becomes by far the, the, the dominant source of formic acid in the atmosphere. And the second thing is that even with the IMAC dioH simulation, so which assumes a high solubility of methane diol, we still have 90 teragram of formic acid that is produced. And in that case too, the multiphase uh, source of formic acid is larger than all the other chemical sources uh, combined. Uh, this, the, the implementation of this multiphase chemistry has also some impact on uh, other atmospheric uh, variables. So as we have seen together at the beginning of uh, this talk, uh, the atmospheric acidity is increasingly determined by natural sources involving uh, organic acids. As uh, we have much, much more formic acid that is produced through the multiphase chemistry, we observe a significant uh, decrease of the pH of the clouds and of the rainwater at the global scale, uh, because we produce more formic acid almost everywhere. And this is particularly strong over uh, continental source regions where, of course, we produce much more formic acid. Now let's have a look at the situation this time uh, in, during the boreal summer. During the boreal summer in the northern hemisphere, we have more formaldehyde. More formaldehyde means that we produce more formic acid through this multiphase pathway. And with more formic acid in the atmosphere, this uh, reduces even more the pH of the clouds and of the rainwater, as you can see on these plots. Implementation of this multiphase chemistry has also some impact on the modeling of formaldehyde, because formaldehyde is at the core of this mechanism. So this is the, the, actually the real fuel of the mechanism. So uh, and in, this means that part of the formaldehyde has been definitely converted into formic acid. And uh, indeed, we observe at the global scale a slight reduction of the formaldehyde simulated by the model. Uh, and this is a bit stronger over continental source regions, for example, over uh, Amazonia or over Central Africa, where we observe that the, the, the model formaldehyde has been decreased by 10 up to 20%. So the, the implementation of this, uh, accounting for this mechanism, might have some implication for, for all the inversions of uh, the emissions of hydrocarbons, uh, which are mainly based on uh, remote sensing measurements of formaldehyde, for example. Now one can wonder if such a, a multiphase mechanism can also apply to other species. And it seems that the answer is uh, yes. So for example, let's have a look first at this very interesting paper, which we, uh, that we have actually uh, discovered only very recently. But this is a paper that has been published uh, 15 years ago, so in, in 2006. And in that paper, they propose uh, kinetic data for a very interesting mechanism. And if, uh, according to that mechanism, we have perfluorinated aldehydes, which are produced from the degradation of HFC and uh, HFCs as well. And these aldehydes can be taken up by rain or cloud droplets. And once in the aqueous phase, it is suggested that they, uh, 
dehydrated and they form their corresponding geminal diol. This diol can be out gas, and once in the gas phase, it is suggested that they react with OH to form carboxylic acids as well. So what we have here is actually more or less the same mechanism as the one we have proposed for the formation of formic acid from formaldehyde and uh, methane diol. So it, it's extremely interesting because it seems that this multiphase chemistry could, could perhaps apply to, to a, a broad range of aldehydes. So for example, let's consider now the hydration and dehydration constant for the main, uh, main aldehyde in the, the atmosphere. So uh, this column represents the, the ratio between the forward and reverse kinetic rate constant for the hydration equilibrium of these aldehydes. As you can see here, the hydration constant for formaldehyde is quite high, but this is also the case for other aldehydes like glyoxal or again methyl glyoxal. We, can, uh, we also have to consider that the dehydration constants for all these species are uh, all in the same range, so uh, close to 10 to the minus um, 10, uh, 10 uh, to the minus 3 per second, which is quite similar to uh, methane diol. So this means that uh, some of these aldehydes, the, in the aqueous phase, once they are they are hydrated, they can undergo the processes. Uh, before being dehydrated. So for example, they can also uh, hot gas. And this is the topic investigated by my colleague at the research center of ULIC. So they investigate the possibility to form higher organic acids uh, from higher aldehydes through a similar multiphase pathway. And uh, to investigate that topic, they have first extended the multiphase mechanism that produces formic acid. So the mechanism we have uh, presented uh, until now. And uh, it has been extended in the uh, uh, new mechanism called JAMOC, so which stands for the ulic aqueous phase mechanism of organic chemistry. So this uh, mechanism is actually a very detailed in cloud oxidation scheme for many oxygenated VOCs. And this is implemented also in the IMAC model. So for example, uh, the JAMOC mechanism includes uh, the phase transfer of many soluble species, the, re, uh, the aqueous phase reactions for a selection of species up to four carbon atoms. And very important, it also represents explicitly the hydration and dehydration uh, of these um, species. Moreover, they have also implemented the, the, the photooxidation of the species that have, uh, the, that have been outcast from uh, JAMOC. So it has been implemented in the gas phase chemistry. What you can see here is the, the new oxidation scheme of glyoxal in the aqueous phase, such as it is implemented in the JAMOC mechanism. So in, in that oxidation scheme, you can observe that uh, you can see that glyoxal is here. And once in the aqueous phase, it can be hydrated to form the glyoxal monohydrate. So uh, considering that the dehydration of this diol is quite slow, it can undergo other processes. For example, it can volatilize. And once in the gas phase, it can be oxidized by OH to form another organic acid, which is here, oxalic acid. Um, but the glyoxal monohydrate can be hydrated a second time. And uh, with this glyoxal dehydrate, uh, this is the same story. It can volatilize, and through a suite of reactions, it can form at the end oxalic acid as well. Uh, so this is how, from glyoxal, you can obtain oxalic acid through a multiphase uh, chemist uh, pathway. And what is also very interesting to notice is that the formation of oxalic acid is accompanied by the formation of formic acid at different steps of uh, the, the, the oxidation mechanism. Now let's have a look at some pre preliminary results with the model implementing this uh, JAMOC mechanism. So we uh, let's have a look first at the formation of pyruvic acid from methyl glyoxal. So as you can see in that table, the, the hydration constant for methyl glyoxal is quite favorable. So this is quite high. This is here on that plot, the global distribution of pyruvic acid, such as simulated by the model IMAC in its base case configuration. So without JAMOC. So in that configuration, it implements only the standard capabilities of most global models in the aqueous space. However, once uh, the, the JAMOC mechanism is accounted for, this means that AMOC, uh, 
Emax rip, uh, represent explicitly the limited dehydration of the diol of methylglyoxal. And it also represents explicitly the, the outgassing of this diol. So this means that uh, with Emac, we have a lot of methylglyoxal diol that can be outgassed and uh, that we, we find in the, the, the gas phase. And upon reaction with OH, this diol leads to the formation of pyruvic acid. And as you can see here, by comparing these two plots, we have now much, much more formic acid that is produced through this multiphase uh, pathway. However, uh, the, this multiphase chemistry is not so efficient for all the aldehydes. So for example, uh, if we consider now the formation of acetic acid from acetaldehyde through the same pathway, so the, through the, the, the limited dehydration of the acetald, uh, acetaldehyde diol, we do not observe much differences between the uh, simulation without JAMOC and the simulation with JAMOC. So we only observe a, a slight increase of acetic acid. And this is due to the fact that in that case, for acetaldehyde, the hydration, the hydration uh, constant are less uh, favorable. And we also have to consider that acetaldehyde is currently largely underpredicted in global models. So this means that anyway, through this multiphase uh, chemistry, we underestimate the, the, the production of acetic acid. Okay, so as a conclusion, we have presented uh, a, a new large source of formic acid in the atmosphere that involves multiphase uh, chemistry. And we have seen that uh, the, the source is actually uh, ubiquitous. We have observed important enhancement of formic acid in both polluted and remote environments. We have also seen that the, this uh, large source is, uh, is stronger that all the known chemical pathways combine and that it has the potential to bridge the gap between the model predictions and the, 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 the observations. In addition, it seems that this uh, multiphase production pathway may also apply to other aldehydes. And in that case, we can have uh, an, an addition, an important production, additional production of organic acids. And this might help to, um, to, to, to explain the elevated concentration in organic acids that we observe in the atmosphere. And we think that uh, this multiphase production pathway may also be active in deliquescent aerosols. However, in, uh, in aerosols, we have less liquid water. However, uh, the aerosols have longer lifetimes and they are also quite abundant in, in high concentrations close to the VOC sources. So this means that potentially we have a, a, a lot of aldehydes available to undergo these processes. And if it is active, if it is efficient, that might explain the elevated concentration of organic acids that we observe in the cloud tree uh, conditions. So I would like now to thank you very much for your attention and also would like to, to, to thank especially uh, all the collaborators to this study. So for example, all the modelers, the experimentalists from the research center uh, in Ulich, uh, modelers from the Max Planck Institute of Chemistry in Mainz, uh, satellite teams at the University of Brussels, and at the Belgian Institute for Space and Aeronomy, as well as many people uh, from the infrared working group of the NDAC uh, network. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Bruno. And for everyone, please, if you have questions, please write your questions uh, on the Slido interface. I can see one question right now from Helen Warden. Could, uh, the question is, could uh, uh, formic acid emission factors for boreal fires be too low? Yes, indeed, this is also what we think. And uh, it might be not only for formic acid, but also for many other species. So for example, uh, perhaps I will share my screen again, perhaps. Um, we have seen that the model, uh, underestimate, um, if I can go back to the right slide, uh, the model not only underestimates uh, formic acid, but it also underestimates um, formaldehyde as well. So this means that uh, for, I think for many VOCs, we are underestimating the impact of the boreal fires 
in, in general. So this might also explain why, despite the multi-phase production of formic acid, we, we might be still too low compared to the remote sensing uh, measurements. Okay. Uh, I don't see more questions, but in the meantime, I can just, I can, I can see like, it's very weird to see like, so high, so very complete study like this, where you use many things, Bruno, you use like satellites, ground-based, 3D modeling, 1D modeling, even theoretical studies. It's, it's very interesting to see this kind of analysis. Uh, there are two more questions, uh, I guess, from Ale, Ale Frank, Frankin. Great work uh, on talk. On slide 24, you show the model improvement. Could you please comment on the discrepancies that are still there? So, uh, Can you go? And I will try to go to the slide 24. 24. Yes. And that one, yes. So yeah, indeed, the, the comparison is still far to be perfect. So in that case, the, the, the first thing is that it is always extremely uh, tricky to compare uh, model simulations to ground-based FTIR measurements, because uh, we have to consider that uh, with the, the, the re relatively coarse resolution of the model, the information uh, in, the, 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 in the, the grid box that contains the stations uh, is diluted. So actually, the, the, the grid box is much, much, much larger than the, the, the part of the atmosphere that is probed by the ground bait FTI measurements. This is why, in general, when you compare ground bait FTI measurements to model data, uh, the, the model, uh, the, the seasonal cycle from the model look, uh, looks completely flattened compared to, to the FTI data. So for example, here at Wollongong, there is something the model is unable to capture, so at the beginning of the year. Or again, in uh, Kiruna, we can observe uh, something, perhaps a fire plume that uh, steered the, 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 the cycle to the, to, to the high value, but this is something the model is not able to, to represent. And um, for example, here in Boulder, it is clear that the, the, the model cannot reproduce the high amplitude of the seasonal cycle of formic acid. So there are local uh, events the model is unable to represent just because the, the inf mainly because the, the information is completely diluted in the grid box that contains the, the FTIR uh, stations. So I see it as the main reason, but of course there can be processes that uh, we are missing and that could be uh, of uh, high relevance uh, at these sites. So for example, um, I'm thinking about the, the I don't see the, the comparisons here, but uh, we have also compared the model to the FTIR measurement at Toronto. In Toronto, um, the, the, the instrument is located in the city center and uh, we observe peaks of some VOCs that we, we cannot represent uh, uh, with the model. Mm -hmm. So we have more questions. Uh, let's see if we can read them. From a question from Mary Bart here from Anchor. Very nice seminar. Are there plans to measure uh, OH, CH2OH in regions near clouds? Uh, for example, shallow cumulus fields? So that one, I will let the <laughs> Domenico answer. <laughs> yeah, sure, I can answer. But uh, the answer is uh, short. Uh, yeah, there, there are no plans. Uh, yeah, um, there are no plans for it. Yeah, Sorry. we didn't think about it. And uh, you would need at least uh, at the current stage two instruments uh, the hunch monitor or uh, an instrument that does uh, <clears throat> liquid uh, der derivatization of uh, formaldehyde that and cannot distinguish between formaldehyde and mesendiol, and then an instrument that measures 
just from our dehyd. So, but yeah, at the moment we don't have uh, those plans. Okay, so we have one more question from Dylan Millet. Hi Bruno, thanks for a great presentation. I guess in the chamber measurements, there was a lot of HO2 present. Could uncertainty in the formaldehyde plus HO2 rate for temperature dependency have any significant impact on the derived formic acid production rate for methane diol? Um, I think that the, the... Uh, yes, of course, this might have an impact, but the experimentalist actually performed a lot of sensitivity tests to, to, to account for uh, the uncertainties on uh, many reactions that can uh, have an impact on the, the, the derived uh, uh, production rate of formic acid from methane dial. Uh, I do not know if they accounted explicitly for this uncertainty. I don't know if, Domenico, you, you know something uh, um, about that one? I should check the details, but uh, I think the, the MCM modeling doesn't represent the formaldehyde oxidation by HO2. Anyway, the oxidation of formaldehyde by HO2 becomes efficient really at very a temperature so typical of the tropical uh, upper troposphere. So, uh, and uh, anyway, the, the, the HO2 levels in the, in the chamber uh, were of uh, atmospheric relevance, like the, the ones of OH. So probably, yeah, something around the 10 to the eight or so then, yeah, I don't expect, uh, I could check it, but um, yeah, I don't think it's, uh, it's relevant in this case. I can see two more questions. One from Brett, Brett Palm. Imax seems to predict high uh, formic acid production extending extending out over the ocean downwind from the Amazon, but the satellite observations do not show this. Do you have any thoughts on the, this discrepancy? Maybe some reaction rate or process that isn't quite captured in the model? Thanks, great work. Yes, actually, that's a problem we have noticed from the beginning with Domenico, and we already discussed a lot together about uh, that that uh, that problem. And uh, actually, the, the the answer is uh, quite basic. So perhaps I will uh, share my screen again. Uh, basically, this is due to the relatively coarse resolution of, of the model. So perhaps, yes. Uh, we can, uh, uh, I think this is uh, what is mentioned in the question. So we are also puzzled to see that we have such a, an enhancement of formic acid there. But this is also the case with all the VOCs that are related to the, the emission from the, the Amazon basin. And actually, uh, we have tested the model, uh, the model at different spatial resolutions. And the more we increase the resolution, so the lower the grid cells, the better we represent the topography of the Andes. And the Andes there act as a barrier uh, to, to the transport of the air masses. So uh, the, the more you, the better you represent the Andes, the more you block the air, you stop the air masses there and they cannot be transported further over the, the, the ocean. So um, what you, you see here is just, uh, it's an artifact of the, the course resolution of the model. Okay, there is, I think there is one more. Yeah, from Eric April. Great talk and work, just a comment. The large formic acid burden in the atmosphere has been a head scratcher for a long time. It is really nice work to establish a more fundamental understanding to the processes that led to the, this production. Bravo. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Eric. I, no. I, I probably, I can ask probably one more. I don't see more questions. I can probably ask. So you mentioned like the 3D, like the model was uh, called course, course resolution. How, I am not in the modeling, but how can you implement these things into other models that work in higher resolution? Is it, or like the general question is, is how can other models implement this in, in the future? Is it, are there plans or do, do, do they contact you for these kind of things? Or? I don't think so, no. But no. I think the, the, the easiest in the, the near future would be to increase the spatial resolution of the model of IMAC. 
So actually, we, we ran the model at the spatial resolution of uh, 1.8 by, by 1.8 degrees. So um, it can be run at a resolution close to one degree by one degree. So uh, this is a resolution we have already tested to, to, to see we, if we had less transport from the Amazonia to uh, the, the, the East Pacific. And, uh, but the main limitation is the, 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 the computing time. So because implementing the entire chemistry of the model plus the entire chemistry in the aqueous phase, especially that now they have extended the aqueous phase uh, chemistry with the, the JAMOC mechanism. So this is, uh, this consumes a lot of uh, computing resources. Yeah, I can add uh, probably that, um, yeah, it's very time consuming and, uh, and uh, usually people don't want to run uh, such expensive uh, uh, atmospheric chemistry models and we are, but we are uh, uh, working a bit um, also on the making the integration of these uh, big models uh, uh, faster. So porting the, the the model to to new architectures and uh, and to use uh, novel um, um, integrate um, ODE integrators. So hoping with the goal that we probably in the near future we can run. Actually, we can already do it, but it's very expensive to run. Uh, the global simulation with uh, with MOM and and the um, explicit multiphase chemistry at at about fifty kilometer resolution, um, and um, as far as I know, other models uh, can have a representation of uh, of uh, aqueous phase chemistry, but uh, at probably different uh, levels of uh, explicitness. But yeah, GeoSCAM and CESM or CAMCAM should be able to to do that already. Um, Okay. Although probably without online uh, calculations of pH, but I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, okay. Well, thank you very much. I, uh, so far, I don't see more questions. I think it's about time to wrap up. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Domenico, and thank you very much, uh, Bruno. Thank you. Uh, it, was, it was great. Yeah, thank you. And thanks, everyone, for joining, and see you in two weeks. Two weeks we have another seminar yeah thank you very much see you everyone bye